Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, most of the things I'm going to be talking about, it's, uh, I learned from some from my grandmother while uh, working with her on the farm several years ago. And also, when I met uh, some colleagues of mine, uh, some from Lund University, with whom I've been doing research um, for probably more than 10 years. Uh, first on the Afrint uh, project, if you've heard about it, and then some other projects we've been working on, and the last, the latest one is um, the Yield Gap project. So, um, I start by giving you uh, a picture of the rural e economy in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, we know now that even though Africa is fastly um, urbanizing, um, still more than half of the population live in rural areas, all right? Um, from about 86% uh, in the early 1960s, now we have about 57%. So a large population still live in, in rural areas of Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and most of these um, people in, in, in rural areas um, depend on agriculture, as we all know it. Um, recent evidence suggests that about 69% of cash income comes from, from agriculture. But of course, there is also um, the non-farm um, rural economy, contributing an average of probably about 22%. From our Afrin studies, we uh, see over the years that um, ranges between about 29% in Zambia to about 50% in, in Mozambique. So um, these rural households are um, diversifying, but still agriculture is, is the most important uh, source of income. But then the usual story uh, about poverty in sub-Saharan Africa, but particularly in rural areas, um, we know that poverty rates have reduced, but much slower uh, than we would expect. Um, so it's still a problem, uh, but there's a large gap between rural and urban areas when you talk about poverty in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, recent estimates suggest about 28% point difference between rural and urban areas. So about 10 years ago, um, the World Development Report uh, probably um, brought back um, agriculture more strongly as um, a channel for poverty reduction um, in what they call agriculture-based countries in sub-Saharan Africa. But agriculture probably in a, in a different way. Uh, not the way we know it, but technology is important. But also the integration between farming and business is important. Um, the picture on the right hand side, you know, in Ghana, um, over the past three years, we've been talking about uh, one district, one factory, linking agriculture production to agribusiness. So that's important if we were to see a more rapid poverty reduction due to agriculture in rural sub Saharan Africa. So the issue of um, productivity is important. But not just that, profitability is important. We know one of the major problems we have in, um, on the continent right now is um, youth unemployment. And in fact, some of the unemployment we are seeing is not uh, from people who are uneducated, but graduate unemployment is a big issue. Um, and therefore, profitability is important, not just productivity. Um, and then, of course, sustainability. I think that's part of the issue that the speaker just spoke about. So these three um, elements are important if we were to see agriculture reduce poverty sustainably um, in the way that we would expect. So the, these issues then bring to the fore the whole issue about um, productivity gaps or yield gaps um, in agriculture. In the Afrin uh, project over the past, um, I think since 2002, uh, what we've been looking at um, 
production in, in rural areas, small villages, uh, in about nine countries initially in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. One of the things we found is that even in villages where you have uh, sometimes average yields of uh, less than a ton per hectare, you find farmers within those same villages who are exposed to probably the same you know, covariate shocks um, doing much better than others. Even if you were to take out the atypical farmers, um, that's the top uh, 95%, uh, the top 5%. You still see some farmers doing um, quite well. And, and this, you know, if you look at even the time series data for at a country level, at a you know, macro level, um, you see this is some um, cereal um, yields in, in sub-Saharan Africa. And you have, um, you know, some people doing um, above two tons per, per hectare, even after you've taken out the very, you know, uh, well performers such as Seychelles and, 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 and South Africa, you still see um, yields uh, above two tons uh, for some countries. So it means that there is the opportunity to, to increase yields even within the same environment. Um, of course, if you look at uh, uh, even the country level, um, at the cross country level, you see yield gaps of around uh, between about 50 to, to up to 65%. So it means that there is room for farmers to increase their yields within the same um, environment. Uh, this is from our, um, our print um, data that we've been uh, carrying out over the past uh, since 2002. And here again, one of the things you realize is that these yield gaps are not necessarily decreasing over time, you know. All right, so you still have, um, on average, um, you know, yield gaps of uh, about 50% to up to about 65% in all these countries. Um, if you look within the villages, you see that there are wide variations in the gaps that we, we observe from sometimes between, uh, uh, in some cases, less than 40% to as high as about 80% within the same village. All right. Um, then about, um, I think about five years ago, we decided instead of looking at um, just uh, the picture at the village level as a whole, uh, to do some studies looking at uh, the plot level within some few villages. Because one of the things we realized was that um, we're not able to study um, uh, the soils and uh, other geophysical aspects um, that could help us explain some of these differences. And so we studied some four villages, two in Ghana and two in Kenya, and even at that level, of course, we still find large differences in production within the same village. Because the variations from between 39% to about 60% in some villages in Ghana. Then that gave us the opportunity also to look at within the household. So we have households that have more than um, course one plot of maize. And even within the household, you find differences in production uh, on their plot. So there are some plots that are doing very well. There are other plots that are not doing well. Right? So these intra-household differences, um, although they are much lower, as you would expect, because um, other management factors and other household level factors are the same within the household. Right? Um, then that also gives us an opportunity to study more uh, about uh, some of the gender differences within the household when it comes to these yield gaps within the household. And here I show within households, for households that, that have more than one plot of maize, it seems that um, the yield gaps tend to be um, higher for male farmers than for female farmers, once you look at the plot level within the household. 
But what accounts for these yield differences? Now, basically, you would think that um, these yield differences should be coming from mainly uh, agronomic uh, you know, practices, right? Um, and so, because we're able to collect more detailed data on soils, on management within the household, on plots, we're able to estimate um, where these differences are coming from. And we see here that if you look at the agronomy, an important difference um, or contributor to the yield differences, as you would expect, is soil quality, the quality of soil. But what we see here is that um, the yield differences tend to decrease, of course, as you expect, as soil quality increases. But at the point, it begins to increase. It means that there are certain elements in the soil, certain characteristics of the soil, in the soil, that, for example, if you have soil pH, right, or as soil pH increases up to a point, you will see that it begins to increase the differences in yield. So there are certain elements that are in the soil in disproportionate amounts, right, in the soil. Of course, you see planting time. One of the things we realized as we drove through a village in the eastern region in Ghana is that at the same time as farmers have planted, you see clearly very wide differences in the way the crops look, and that is attributed to the time of planting. Some farmers plant at the right time. Many others don't plant at the right time because of um, the, the unpredictability of, of planting days due to climate variability and change. And so you will see the planting time is critical for these differences that we are seeing. And of course, you see um, things like improved seed, fertilizers, and also um, weeds, right? And uh, as you see in this picture, this is a farm in um, one of the villages in the eastern region um, <laughs> with a lot of weeds. And weeds tend, as you would expect, an important um, uh, contributor to this difference. Now, but what about beyond the agronomy, other sources of the differences, which um, I would come to? Um, we see that labor, I would highlight two of them. I mean, we talked about the, the previous pre presenter talked about labor, how labor could be saved by at, um, going the way of the perennials. And we see here that labor availability is an important source of these differences, right? And one of the things we realized recently in, in, in at some of our studies in Ghana is that um, rural households tend to be investing a lot in child education, first because of private investments in child education, but also because of um, uh, public policies that are promoting uh, issue about free high school education, free education. So you go to the villages, and a lot of children who were helping with the farms have gone to school. And so labor is becoming scarce. And uh, in those days, we used to have labor from the northern parts of Ghana that come seasonally to the south to work on farms. But the same issue about education, which is a good thing, uh, not too many labor, too much labor is coming down from the north to the south. So you have a lot of issues with labor. That which then leads into farmers using a lot of uh, herbicides, and sometimes in very large amounts, which then tend to kill a lot of um, the, the mushrooms and the snails that they, they use before. So the labor issue is a critical issue um, in, in most of Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so <clears throat> the absence of labor is an important contributor, but education uh, and so on also contributes to that. And I also highlight the issue of um, information. Information. And I'll come to that um, uh, again later in my, my, my uh, talk, is that um, we were discussing yesterday with uh, a colleague, um, Sigrun, talking about in Mozambique how farmers were applying a lot of fertilizer, sometimes up to about uh, 
on their small plots of out of about uh, a ton per hectare and put in a lot of water, right? Because of those small plots. And uh, a lot of the nitrogen, of course, uh, goes away. So information about management of these plots is critical. So farmers who have information, more information about how to manage their plots tend to have lower um, yield gaps. Um, so information contributes to the reduction of the, of the yield gaps. And then also the issue of credit. Of course, we know today on the continent that there's very little you know, agricultural credit. In fact, if you look at the data across Southern Africa, about 8%, only about 8% of farmers get credit for agriculture. Of course, there's a bit more credit in the rural economy, but for other things, not agriculture, right? And you see here that credit is critical uh, for reducing these gaps. Now, once you put um, all these factors together, you see that most of the agronomic factors remain important, but the critical one, the non-agronomic factors again, is your labor availability and the information. Right. So the availability of labor and information is critical. And of course, the lack of investments you know, that we see, I talked about credit and those other factors, is associated with risk. The way agriculture is practiced today in most rural areas of Africa is risky. And of course, business people don't want to in invest very much in it. And of course, farmers are intelligent. Why should they invest in, reducing, in, in, in producing more right, uh, by applying fertilizers, uh, using seeds when they are not sure of what the outcome is going to be because of climate, uh, climate issues, climatic factors. And you would see here, as we look at the data uh, from 1962, looking at um, uh, uh, yield growth, one of the things that is striking for Africa is it's very noisy, very erratic. You know? So some years you have very good yields, other years very poor yields because of the rain-fed nature of agriculture, right? So that is an important factor when you, you see this uh, yield differentials that we see in, in Africa. So what are the possible solutions? Of course, we saw the issue of soils, um, soil management. We saw the issue of uh, planting time and weeds, right? Now, there are some simple solutions, some not very simple. Now, the first one i talk about is the issue of information. So how can we get information to farmers? Because sometimes, you know, when you're talking about solutions, uh, you ask people, people are talking about what government can do, what donors can do. But first of all, what can farmers themselves do? And for information, we tried um, looking at, um, I'll describe to you um, um, an RCT, an experiment that we did recently in Ghana, uh, trying to answer the question, how can we get information to farmers in a way that boosts adoption? So we, uh, there, there was this real world project uh, funded by AGRA, looking at um, how to get information about inoculants legume inoculants to farmers in northern Ghana. So inoculants are um, rhizobium, inoculants that are able to help the plant fix atmospheric nitrogen. And we know uh, fertilizers, nitrogen fertilizers are expensive in Africa. Um, and of course, they are not necessarily environmentally uh, um, friendly. Right? So inoculants is thought to be a way. So we designed this experiment where we send information to farmers through video documentaries and also through radio listening clubs. So here you have the videos, a video documentary, using video tricycle vans to give farmers information about uh, the inoculants, but also about uh, uh, what they termed good agronomic practices, as we saw was influential. And then the other thing was to let them form radio listening clubs within the villages. So um, 
the information is broadcast on radio, but they form these clubs where they give them call credit, they call into the radio stations, and then they can ask questions and discuss. Um, before the experiment, um, this is um, you know, uh, legume adoption uh, in grams. Uh, there was no difference uh, between those, the villages that received the videos, those that were assigned the radio, radio listening clubs and also between those who had the radio and, uh, and, the, and the video. And we see, after the experiment, um, we see a positive impact in terms of uh, inoculant adoption for those who receive the videos, but not the radios. I mean, there is a reason for the radios. One of the reasons uh, for the radio listening clubs, the, some of the women complained at the time that they broadcast the, uh, uh, the show, and when the clubs meet, they are not able to, to, some of them are not able to attend because of their reproductive uh, duties at home. So we see an impact with the video, but not the radio. So this one way of um, making information available to rural farmers in a way that can boost um, um, adoption. Um, we also see that um, here, the videos also had an impact on reducing yield gap. Uh, legume yield gaps in, in, in this case. So we see some evidence that, you know, relaying information to farmers in a way that they understand can help them make some changes in terms of how they do their farming. So this are the farmer level. What about seeds and, and fertilizers? In Ghana, there is um, recently, uh, I think the flagship program, they call it, uh, what do you call it? planting for food and jobs. So government is spending a lot of money providing farmers with seeds and fertilizer. Well, is that a solution? Maybe it's part of the solution. But it's not. Um, because the reason is, um, so some years, you know, government comes out and says, oh, well, the program is doing very well. Yields have increased. Production has increased. In another year, it doesn't do so well but nobody makes a lot of noise about it, is because if you give farmers seeds and fertilizer and you do nothing about water, um, it doesn't work. So when the rains are good, then the yields are good because the fertilizer and the seeds are. But when the rains are not good, it doesn't do anything, right? So we need infrastructure. Uh, of course, irrigation is important, but also to minimize the risk, um, Recently, uh, Chris Udry and his colleagues carrying out experiments in northern Ghana about index insurance. So index insurance in rural areas could be one of the solutions. But also the market, because you see, um, subsidies by themselves, I don't think is a long-term solution to the problem in Africa. You need asset accumulation, that could come from the non-farm sector to finance agriculture that could then lead to you know, productivity increases in the staple food sector. Then you can move on to you know, what uh, some call the, um, uh, agricultural transformation, that's diversification to, to higher value crops. Right? And then you can talk then about rural transformation where then you have interactions with you know, uh, uh, that, that non-farm sector processing and so on, and then you can have rural transformation, right? And so markets are important in that respect in dealing with the issue, not just supplying farmers with seeds and fertilizers. It may not be sustainable. And we've seen that across the continent. Um, what about labor, the issues of labor and credit? Well, technology, would be important to deal with the issues of, of labor. Um, you know, when I was growing up, uh, my you know, grandmother's farm, I never wanted to become a farmer because, I mean, we go to the farm in the morning, work until the sun is coming up, probably sometimes we rest a little bit on the farm and continue again the, the drudgery there. I mean, I didn't want to become a farmer. So, but with technology, uh, probably more young people would be interested to, to go into farming. 
So that deals with the issue of labor. Um, but what about credit? Now, one of the things we, we, we found in some of our studies in, in Ghana, is also in Mali, and, and recently in Niger, is that um, you know, the cost of credit is so high, I mean, no farmer would be able to borrow under the conditions that they work to be able to make any profit at all. I mean, there was a time in Ghana they came up with uh, development banks. Now the, the agricultural development banks are purely commercial banks. Right? So unless we, we, we find um, credit um, in a way <clears throat> that is sustainable, especially from the farmer's point of view, so you have a lot of farmer indebtedness now in, in most parts of, of rural Ghana. So um, <clears throat> just to, <clears throat> to conclude, we need multiple solutions because the problems that farmers face in rural Africa are multiple. There are multiple constraints. And therefore, um, coming up with a solution that tackles one aspect of the problem doesn't seem to work, right? So if you come out with a problem that tackles credit, or a problem that tackles only labor, or a problem that tackles only improved seed, or a problem that tackles a solution that tackles only one of these, it doesn't seem to work. We would need, um, in order to get to rural transformation, we would need to gradually build farmers' capacity to build assets. And I here I emphasize the non-farm sector because uh, very little credit available, and therefore farmers rely a lot more on their own resources through their production and also the non-farm sector in order to transform, right? And to lead to structural transformation, building assets of smaller, uh, smallholder farmers leading to them to transformation within agriculture, productivity increases that would come as a result of some of the factors I've already mentioned, the technology, is the way to go in order to then link them to the kind of markets that are able to provide the kinds of income that go beyond just subsistence to transformation within the rural economy and within sub-Saharan Africa as a whole. Thank you very much.